Saints. Uh, I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. Uh, another Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, as you know, we're working our way through the Pauline epistles. We're on Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 tonight. So go get your Bibles ready if you haven't already done that. And before we get into the scriptures, uh, let's give a greeting to the congregation. Let's start with Brother Cripps. Oh, you, you you did a switcheroo on me. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I'm glad I was ready. I was like, yeah. okay, let me unmute. I got to keep uh, you off balance. I got to keep right. you off balance. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to be here, and I'm also glad that we're starting a new chapter. I always think, you know, it's like getting a fresh gift uh, when you're starting a new chapter. And as we pointed out, there are several times that uh, Paul is continuing a thought. You know, the chapter numbers don't always uh, mean much as far as the chronology of what's being said, but it still seems like a fresh gift when we start a broadcast on a new chapter, regardless. So um, I'm excited about the chapter. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad everyone's here and say hello to everyone in the chat and uh, let's get going. Amen. And and uh, this this particular book uh, only has six chapters. Um, it's, it's one of the most profound and important books, and yet it's so much smaller than Romans and the Corinthian books that we went through earlier. So the few chapters we have are amazing. All right, uh, Sister Renee, why don't you say hi to everybody? Hey there, beloved saints. Yep, I agree with you, Brother Cripps. I love Star. I love this chapter. I love it. I love this entire epistle. Amen. I, um, there, there's... Galatians is one of the best books for defending the simplicity in Christ. I love it. Amen. All right. Uh, Brother Ben, do you have a greeting for the congregation? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here again tonight with you. I'm looking forward to the uh, study and the uh, the spirit-filled things you guys are going to be saying. Oh. All right. Thank you. I, I'm, <laughs> I pray you're right. So Lord, right now, please. Fill us with the Spirit, empower us to understand these scriptures. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so help hello. me not to make a bunch of noise in the background. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm going to try to mute as much as possible, but I don't want Ben to freak out over it too much. But I'll be doing. I'll do the best I can. Zeus uh, is doing his best squeaking behavior. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so let me just say hi to the congregation first. Looks what we got Hendrix there. And uh, we, oh, uh, Ben, um, could you uh, make Heather a, a, a moderator? Uh, that we we wanted to reinstate her as a moderator now that she says that she uh, has has the time to focus on that. If you, I don't know if you're able to do it now, but I appreciate. Yep, I sure it. will. I'll do it so, now. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Heather, for volunteering again for that uh, responsibility. It's uh, and you're very trustworthy to, to to do the job. So thank you. Um. All right, so hello to the whole congregation. Let's get into the scriptures now. Uh, we'll go to chapter 5, verse 1, the KJV. First, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Sister Renee, can you untwist that for us? Well, uh it is a continuing thought from chapter four. He just finished showing us how Hagar and Sarah were allegories for the law and grace. That Sarah and Isaac, who was the child of God's promise and not through works of Abraham's flesh, uh, and Hagar represents the law, the bondservant, Ishmael, works of Abraham's flesh. It was his own work that created that child, whereas Isaac is a child of the promise. And so he's showing that uh, the allegory is the law is to be cast out because he says, cast out the bond woman and her son. Because here it says, cast out the bond woman and her son for the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then brethren, we are not children of the bond woman, but children of the free. So continuing in that vein, what he's saying is now, because you're a child of the free of grace, do not go back in bondage of the law. That's why he says, stand fast. Therefore, therefore, why? Because cast out the law, cast out the bond woman and her son. 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He tells us that the law is bondage. And so they were trying to bring this Galatian church under the yoke of the bondage of the law. And he's telling them why that's not possible, why they need to stand in their liberty. Oh, there you go. There you go. Hey, all right. Thank you, sister. Uh, and Brother Cripps, I'll read the Amplified uh, translation, but uh, I, I'd like to ask you a question here. Uh, in the KJV, it says, stand fast, therefore. So uh, uh, I think that uh, Sister Renee, uh, she noticed that word, therefore. What, what do you think that we should uh, learn from that word, therefore? Yeah, I was going to I was actually going to say that as part of one of the best things that I, Renee has always done is, is is gone back to what we talked about before. And so this is an instance that I mentioned at the top where the uh, the chapter uh, 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 separations don't always mean anything. It may not be a fresh thought. And certainly this one isn't a fresh thought. He's going back to the same point that we talked about last week. And, and Renee went into that. So I don't have to I don't have to take any more time going into that. But she made that point going against the, the uh, or not, do not be entangled again with in the yoke of bondage, which we talked about what that is. And then Renee mentioned again. So she does a really good job of that. So I never have to worry about uh, explaining that, especially since she goes first. And I, I'm glad that she does go first. It gives me some time to catch my breath and uh, maybe hear the Amplified if I need it. This one's, this one's pretty clear. I do want you to read the Amplified uh, and then I'll comment. But uh, yeah, therefore means a continuing thought. That's my long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, uh, the idea of context, of course, is, uh, uh, I'd say it is maybe the most important, or at least the top two or three uh, most important uh, fundamentals in our study and interpretation of Scripture, uh, looking at the context. So uh, that word, therefore, tells us go, uh, th uh, this applies to what was said before. So you better connect the dots. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. right. And the Amplified, uh, it says, it was for this freedom that Christ set us free. That is completely, completely liberating us. Mm. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not subject again to a yoke of slavery, which you once removed. Okay, now this is a this is a point where I could go on a political rant about things that are going on, and I, and I won't do that. But I'll say that we live in a country where we're supposed to be free, and thank God that even though the country we live in there uh, doesn't appear to be free anymore, we still have freedom in Christ. And and what a great freedom! That's that's more free. The liberty that we have in Christ is more free than any kind of personal freedom we might have in any country. So uh, I, I'm glad that nobody can take that away, regardless of what other freedoms are taken away. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, but yeah, the Amplified uh, changed the word a little bit, uses freedom instead of liberty. They basically mean the same thing. Uh, but the bottom line, they both say, Christ hath made us free. Amplified says, Christ hath uh, set us free. Same thing, though. I love the way the Amplified says, completely liberate, completely liberating us. And that's true. We're completely liberated. Why would we then want to go back into bondage if we're completely free? Uh, this this is the way that the human mind works, unfortunately. And and I'll, I'll go back briefly into history and and say that uh, after the Civil War in the South, and a lot of the uh, slaves were set free. Some of them didn't didn't know where to go or what to do with themselves, and they asked if they could stay on. Can you believe that they were slaves? They were not free in any way, and then they were free. They didn't know what to do with their liberty. So that's a difficult thing, but we know what to do with our liberty. Hopefully, as believers, we know what to do with our liberty in Christ, which is help free others. I mean, the Holy Spirit does all the work, but we're commanded to shine the light. We're commanded to be salt uh, salt and light to the, to the rest of the world, and that's a challenge to me. It's always been a challenge to me, and I hope that I continue to do that more and more as I grow in him. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. I don't really have anything I can add to that. Uh, you and Renee's comments were uh, more than enough. So let me go back to the KJV for verse two. It says, 
Behold, I, Paul, will say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. All right, Brother Cripps. Sure. Wow, that was quick. I muted and <laughs> I got to get used to that quick turnaround. Uh, let's see. So the circumcision, I I think he's talking uh, uh, about. He he might be mentioned the physical, but I think it's 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 more following in uh, since the verse above talked about being under the yoke of bondage. So I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that it that it means that he means that that he means going back in bondage, like he said in the first verse um, of the circumcision, uh, meaning going back under the uh, same uh, laws that the Judaizers uh, uh, are trying to get people to do. And he's saying that if you do that, then uh, Christ shall profit you nothing. I think that's clear. I'll be interested to see what the Amplified says about it. But yeah, that's what it means to me um, because of the verse above, because of what he first said about bondage. And then he's saying, behold, uh, I, Paul, am saying to you that if you're circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So if if Christ gives you liberty, circumcision uh, uh, cuts you off from from the liberty that that Christ wants to offer, when the law offers only bondage. All right, thank you. All right, Sister Renee, how what do you say? Yeah, well, for one, once we're in Christ, we have direct access to God. That's it. It's all through Him. So mm -hmm. to go back to these rituals and to have, do you realize all the stuff they had to do to even approach God? Some of them offered strange fire and dropped dead in his presence. It's like they, they had to do all this superficial stuff to even be able to come into his presence. Now we come boldly to the throne of grace because of Jesus. Why would you go back to that? Mm -hmm. The thing here is if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing because what you're <coughs> saying is I'm going to leave. Uh, sorry, the dog. is I'm going to accept circumcision as how I'm a relatable to God now, which means I'm going to enter into the old covenant and put me under that bondage. So I've actually reversed and gone backwards because I don't understand that all those things were a shadow. Physical circumcision was a symbol of the circumcision of the heart, which is already done, and that's permanent. And that's done by faith in what Christ did. So if I think I got to be circumcised, I uh, Christ doesn't profit me anything because I don't understand what he's accomplished. Mm. I, I'm going back to the shadow. And, and that's what all this stuff does. It takes you backwards to the shadow when we've already got the image of things. I mean, if you look in Hebrews, it says, you know, these, all, these things were all just shadows, pictures, and not the very image. So... Uh, that that just shows lack of understanding that Christ doesn't profit you anything if you think something you're doing is is making you right with God. Then you don't understand Christ can't profit you because you're relying on something you're doing now. All right. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I'll read it in the Amplified and then comment. It says, uh, notice... It is I, Paul, who tells you that if you receive circumcision, that is, as a supposed requirement of salvation, Christ will be of no benefit to you, for you will lack the faith in Christ that is necessary for salvation. Um, I, I would say that uh, whoever translated that uh, is welcome in this Bible study to participate with us. <laughs> I would say they're in complete agreement with our understanding and they stated it as perfectly as it could be stated. Uh, and I wanted to say before I read that, that um, the, um, the idea of uh, saying that if you're circumcised, Christ profit you nothing, uh, there, there's two ways a person could, could uh, look at that. Um, uh, if, if you are already saved and then you decide to get circumcised is one way. Uh, and, and that is what the book has been about, um, talking to people who already got saved and now are going back to uh, believing that they got to convert to Judaism and, and get circumcised and follow the laws of Moses. But in this case, and I think the, the way that uh, the uh, Amplified um, phrased it, uh, 
uh, supports what I'm just going to say. And, and that is, this is not really talking about the, the problem of, look, you're, you've believed and now you're going back to legalism. This is just talking about uh, how a person gets saved. You don't get saved by um, um, f following some legal system, whether it's Judaism or any religious system. Anytime you put yourself under a religious system, which is really all religions are the same. It's a, um, a system of do's and don'ts uh, in your attempt to earn approval from God. Uh, so we, we say that religion says do, but Christ says done. So uh, that's what religion is. And circumcision is the initiation into the Jewish religion. This is how you become a Jew. You get circumcised as a sign that you've, you've accepted this uh, in, you're into Judaism, and then you're expected to follow all the tenets, uh, 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 Sabbath keeping, uh, following all the laws of Moses, temple worship, animal sacrifices, all of these things are expected when you convert to Judaism. So uh, I think Paul is making the point, we should understand verse 2 as, uh, in order to, if, uh, if anybody thinks that they can get saved through circumcision or entering into some legal agreement with God, uh, then uh, Christ has, has no value, no benefit to you. We shouldn't think of this in the context of the book as a whole, I think, in this case, because that would be telling us that uh, uh, if you got saved and then you decide to get circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. And we know that's not the case. So I believe that this is talking about basic, a basic gospel message here that uh, it's, uh, you know, Christ only pro benefits those who do not put faith in, in circumcision. Um, all right. Does anybody want to respond to that or any, say anything more? Yeah, especially that last thing you said. That was an excellent point. That uh, had to have been from the Holy Spirit. Uh, that was that was incredible. Thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Uh, all right. Um, if there's no more, let's go back to uh, the KJV. Sister Renee, I'll read verse 3 for you. It says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Mm. Renee? Yeah, I have said this many times. The law is not broken up into pieces that you think you can do. It's not uh, the ceremonial and the moral and the, it, and it, it's not. It's all of it. The law is all of it. It's all 613. It's not just the Decalogue. You can pull the 10 out and you're justified by those. It's if you add any work of the law, if you think, even if you want to say uh, like the Seventh-day Adventist, you want to add Sabbath keeping to what keeps you safe, right? That's the law. You better be keeping the whole of the law, which you can't because there are no more animal sacrifices and temple systems. So you can't possibly do it anyway. But because you're trusting in one part of the law, you're now a debtor to all of it. Because if you want to be justified by what you do, you better do it perfectly from birth till death. And that's what people can't get. So if you, I testify every man that is circumcised. Now, that doesn't mean, like, I think Timothy later did get circumcised. I think that was as a Jew, I, become a Jew, I became a Jew. This was not so that he would be saved. This was something he wanted to do because he didn't at other times. So when what he's talking about is that if you think you have to have a physical circumcision in order to have a covenant with God, you now must keep all of the law. Because you don't understand that it's circumcision of the heart by faith in Christ that makes you in a relationship with the Lord, not works of the law. So that if you get circumcised. This is Christ. Uh, for I testify again to every man that circumcised, he's a debtor to do the whole law. There's no breaking it up in pieces. You can't trust in a piece of the law. It's the law, or it's God's grace through faith in what Christ has done. There is no mixture of it, and that is what most churches are preaching: Jesus plus this, Jesus plus pieces of the law, Jesus plus keeping the Ten Commandments. It's it's Jesus plus something. And because they're adding the plus something, Jesus is of no effect to them. 
Amen. Amen. All right, to Brother Cripps, uh, let me read this in the Amplified. Uh, verse 3 says, Once more, I solemnly affirm to every man who receives circumcision as a supposed requirement of salvation that he is under obligation and required to keep the whole law. Hmm. Yeah, that this is a powerful verse, and Renee did a great job explaining it. So I'll just I'll I'll just add that um, because of my uh, well, Renee has experience with this too. Uh, she has said that she got into the Hebrew rooters back in the day, a long a long time ago, um, and a lot of people are doing that still. And it, it seems like that this shouldn't be a problem today. But as I pointed out so many times as we've been going through these epistles, it was a problem back then, and it's still a problem today. And I've had many conversations with some of these guys, and some of them I, I knew as uh, professing uh, grace believers before. But my question is, if they believed in grace, then why would they then put themselves back under uh, the bondage of the law? Because that's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul's preaching. Am I wrong about that? Is that not what Paul's preaching against here? To me, that he is. He is preaching against that. So how can a person that fully believes in grace then put themselves back on the law if they understand it? Renee said that, and and Brother Luke said it too. The the only way that Christ would ben not benefit you is if, if you were putting up something else as collateral to save you when Jesus did everything. He saved you. He saved us all. We have we have that right there waiting for us. Uh, it's It's offered to us. All the work's been done. So if we put something of our own up, uh, then that's how it doesn't benefit you. That, Brother Luke made that very clear in his last comment. I thought it was brilliant. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, I'm paraphrasing the nature of what was said rather than what he uh, said exactly. Um, so uh, in the Amplified, uh, I understand it very well from just the King James Version, but the Amplified, once more, I solemnly affirm every man who receives circumcision as the supposed requirement of salvation that he is under obligation required to keep the law. They can't do it. That's the thing that confused me. The Hebrew rooters are anyone that puts themselves back in the law. The, the very fact that they think that they can do it even. I mean, do you know how many laws there are? I, I forget the exact number, but there are a lot of there are a lot of laws. So what Paul's saying here, if you're doing one, you're you're on the hook for all of them. So why would you want to do that to yourself when Christ has done it all for you? I, I don't understand it. I really don't understand it except they have no understanding of what God did and they have no understanding of what grace he's offered. That's the only thing I can, that's the only conclusion I can come to. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, well, Paul is talking about uh, circumcision and uh, the, the laws of Moses uh, in context here, but uh, he did mention earlier that uh, there's a, uh, another law for Gentiles, and that's the law of conscience. So I think it's important for everybody to understand that whether it's circumcision into the Judaism, uh, Judaism religious system, or, or whether it's water baptism into a Christian religious system, it's the, the same problem uh, where uh, you're um, imposing uh, a set of rules, and regulations on people as a, uh, in addition to just the cross, uh, the finished work on the cross. We've all heard that saying that the, you know, the, the gospel or, or salvation is the cross plus nothing. So if you're adding circumcision or water baptism or any number of other things, uh, a, a, um, a person's uh, having a changed life as proof or uh, a person agreeing with all the different tenets that you, uh, you, you believe that have to believe, what, whatever it is you're adding to the cross, you're, you've got a different gospel then. And uh, it's a false gospel. It's uh, um, what Paul uh, says, I'm, uh, even if an angel comes to you with a, another gospel and the other gospel is the cross plus something anything so um that's true whether uh, you're talking about uh, joining uh, judaism as a religion or joining you know roman catholicism for their religious system or mormonism or anything even even um, uh, people who um, most people consider uh, biblical christians a lot of them still put themselves under some kind of rules and regulations thinking that that it contributes to their salvation. 
Um, all right, any more from either of you? All right, let me go back then to uh, verse four in the KJV. Uh, Crips, I think this is your turn. It says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. Oh, okay. I didn't read ahead, but I was taught, I, I was kind of making that point about that they don't understand grace, and, and Paul's going a step further and saying, not only do you not understand it, but you've fallen from it. So that's interesting. Um, fallen from grace uh, because you don't understand it. Again, I, I if you understand it, you, there's no way that you would that you would make a decision. Uh, to put yourself back under under, I think I think we can all agree that there that there is a decision here in going back under the law. So I, I don't think that they trusted it. I don't think that they uh, fully grasped uh, grasped it. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you justified by the law. Um, if we understand the grace that comes through Christ uh, and what He did and we understand that it was done for us, and we have nothing else to do. Um, also, Brother Luke, you, you've made this point several times, and I've taken it as my own. Um, I probably even say it a little bit differently, but you have the glass of water, and probably, maybe it didn't come from you. Maybe someone else did it, and uh, n none of us have come up with it on our own, I'm sure. But if you have a glass of water, it's 100% water, and you put 1% poison, it's still poison. So if you're adding the law, it's still poison. You're, if you're 99% right about everything else, but you're adding something other than what Christ did, and it's from yourself, and you're trying to count on that to save you, as Paul's saying, you're falling from grace. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment more on your point but after Renee takes yeah. her turn. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Sister Renee, what's your thoughts on this? I, I, this is the verse that, one of the verses that kept gnawing at me before I began this ministry, uh, and it was to reach people already sitting in churches. Mm. Um, the The key thing I want people to see here is no effect. Mm. Christ has become a zero effect to you if you're justified by the law. If you think that your righteousness what you're doing is reconciling you to God and your relationship is based, and we still have this religious thinking, is based on your own performance, that God's opinion of you is based on your performance, then Christ is of no effect to you because you don't understand yes. what he's done on Calvary has reconciled you to God. Yes. And that his righteousness is imputed on you when you simply trust what he did on Calvary. So he is of no effect to you. So if you're not saved and you think you're going to be saved or justified or declared righteous in the sight of God by the law, then you have no savior. Mm. Jesus is of no effect unto you. If you are saved and you, you tend to, wrestle with this error then he's of no effect to you in your walk because now you think your strength and your positional relationship is somehow contingent upon you and your performance now i get this a lot of people that are saved still have the religious thinking right. that somehow god's mad at them because they're still struggling with something what loving father beats a kid or does cruel things to them while they're trying? Mm. They're trying to grow. He's not here to beat us up because we're, we're trying and failing. We're not in rebellion to God because our flesh fails. We're trying to grow in him and rely more and more on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, not our own strength. But when we get saved, sometimes we go right back to that religious thinking. And now it's all about our works instead of resting in Christ, growing in grace, not in fear and sin consciousness, mm. but knowing who we are in Christ. We go right back. We get saved. And then we go right back to that kind of religious thinking that God's opinion of us is based on our performance. Amen. And that's not true. He sees Jesus in our place. 
he saw Jesus in our place on Calvary. Wow. And so every time he, I may look at my failure, he sees the cross of Christ yes. in my place. I can't be accused because my positional standing is in Christ. So the thing here is that Jesus Christ is zero effect to you. If you're relying on what you're doing, there is no savior. That's what I keep trying to tell people. It's either what Jesus did or what you do. But you better choose which one you're going to trust in because there is no mixture of the two. To be of grace, no longer of works. Otherwise, grace, no more grace. Here it tells you Christ is of no effect to you. Whosoever you're justified by the law, you're falling from grace. Mm -hmm. So it's one or the other. I think this is one of the clearest verses that shows us that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, amen. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on the phrase fallen from grace, but uh, let me take a turn and then I'll come back to you. Uh, I'd like to connect the dots here on these verses we've covered so far. Uh, he, he's saying that, look, uh, um, you should stay in, in liberty instead of being under bondage. And, and that uh, if you uh, have faith in circumcision, then you're under bondage, and it, 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 there's no value in that. It won't, you can't get saved that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, but if you do want to be under circumcision, what puts you under a legal system, then you're obligated to follow every law, the whole law, mm -hmm. and uh, and that means Christ. There's no value in Christ because you're relying on the, your own merit, personal merit instead. And uh, so, but regarding the the grace question, Crips, the uh, I made a video. Uh, a Sin City preacher titled uh, uh, Un uh, Unadulterated Grace. And, um, you know, when, when we look at the uh, Ten Commandments, uh, there is one commandment that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. I had somebody tell me one time that he th didn't believe that was talking about sexual sin, but he thought, and I, I don't know if this is the case, I, I, this is something we should all consider, I think. Uh, but... Uh, um, if you look up the word adulterate or adulterated, um, if you get a definition of that, not adultery, but adulterate, uh, it is to make something impure, not 100% pure anymore. It's, it's not 100%, it's, you know, it's uh, impure. That's adulterated. And so the uh, don't commit adultery in the, in the Jew Jewish mindset at that time would be, Look, God says we are not to uh, intermarry with other nations, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't want to um, join with them. They've got pagan religions. They will come in. They will mix, uh, and and then our faith will also be adulterated. It won't be pure anymore because it'll be mixed with paganism. So that was God's uh, warning and command to Israel to not commit adultery by intermarrying, and and um, uh, because your the faith will become changed and, and adulterated. Um, Paul also talks about, uh, phrases it this way, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, yeah. and to indicate this, the same thing. Uh, you have pure purity, you add just even a tiny bit of yeast, and it spoils the whole lump. Uh, so a little leaven leavens the whole lump is talking about false teachings. You bring in the false teaching, now it's no longer pure. So that's what uh, is, when you fall from grace, it means that now you don't have grace anymore because it's not 100% grace. It's only grace if it's 100% grace. Paul says that um, if, if it's works, it, it's no longer grace. If it's grace, it's no longer works. You cannot mix the two together. Otherwise, you don't have either one. Right. All right. Uh, so, Sister Renee, would you give me your uh, interpretation yeah. of the uh, fall from grace? Yeah, falling from grace here it, it, for the church as a whole, they've fallen from grace. They've lost their liberty and their freedom, and now they've put themselves in bondage. Uh, I've heard a lot <coughs> false teachers say, see, right here says they lost their salvation. <coughs> falling from grace doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It means you lost the liberty. You lost the freedom. Now you're gone under religious bondage instead of continuing and growing in maturity. In addition, if you were never saved uh, and you think being saved is part of the law is getting you saved, you've fallen from grace in the sense that you're never saved. Right. You, you've rejected the grace. Right. But you're talking about the church as a whole and now you think you're saved because it says, you know, you received the spirit. 
if you're saved and you get it fall into the error that somehow your performance is now uh, uh, making your relationship, the continuing relationship with God is based on your performance. Well, Christ is of no effect to you and you've fallen from grace. You've mm -hmm. lost the liberty and you're now in bondage. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a whole, I think that's what they're talking about. Yeah, good distinctions there, right? All right. I wanted to respond to something in the chat room. I had it highlighted, but lost it. I think it was a comment by Mike. Uh, and he's, he said that he's a struggling or, or, or wants to, is trying to uh, grow and mature spiritually, something to that effect. And I would say, Mike, any, anybody else interested, uh, that uh, th that's accomplished by what you're doing right now. You, uh, you uh, join fellowship, you, you study the Bible, uh, pray, you pray, and you get busy in some kind of service to the Lord. These are the ways that we uh, uh, grow into spiritual maturity. So uh, just keep doing it. You're going to grow and mature, uh, especially if you're willing to um, uh, listen to the Holy Spirit and, and surrender your, over to the Holy Spirit. And, and when the Holy Spirit's attempting to you know, change your mind, uh, your desires, your attitudes, you know, listen and, and then surrender. Don't resist it. If you do that, then you will uh, grow and mature uh, quickly, I believe. All right, Brother Luke, yes. ask us to, because the verse says, whosoever you're justified by the law, you're falling from grace. You want us to tell it what justified is. Justified means to be made just or declared in right standing with God. So to be justified means you're declared just. You're declared righteous. You are now in right standing in God's eyes. That's what justified means, to be declared righteous, to be declared just, to be in right standing with God. Mm -hmm. In terms of salvation, you, you, you can remember it like this, and I forget where I picked this up, but it's just as if I'd never sinned. Amen. Greg. In terms of salvation. Amen. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Uh, I want to add one real quick thing, if I might, about the growth, too. Um, I, I, this is something I've learned and I've seen a lot of people that also struggle with this when, if they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to grow and it doesn't seem to be working. I'm not saying that's what the person said. Uh, but if, if, if it seems like I would like to add to what brother Luke said and say, uh, that the growth doesn't come from you. I mean, do all those things brother Luke mentioned? Yes. I mean, we can do that. We, we have a, a certain responsibility to, to be open to what the Holy Spirit is doing, but the growth comes from him and it's effortless. <laughs> when you stop trying in your own power and let him uh, grow you, because all the, all the fruits are his, they're not ours. Uh, we produce them. Uh, I mean, we display them, but they're the production of the Holy Spirit's work in our life. So when you stop trying in your own effort and, and let the Holy Spirit work in you, that is uh, extremely helpful. I'm not saying that the things Brother Luke said you shouldn't do. You should do all that. Uh, everything that you're doing, do that. But if, if you have a, a change of mind about it being you uh, uh, trying to do the work, uh, it, it's a lot easier. It becomes effortless when you just allow the Holy Spirit to do the work himself, because that's the way that it works. I think you're muted. Yes. OK, thank you. All right. Let's go back to uh, the KJV verse five. Uh, I think Sister Renee's turn now. Uh, for we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Yeah, um, well, the whole point here is he's saying that we're justified in the sight of God by faith in what Christ has done. And so again, he brings us back. So the birth, so we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. He's just confirming again, we have God's righteousness by faith in what Christ did. Not righteousness by the law. It tells us by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight. So he's just bringing them back to the truth again, that people are claiming you got to be circumcised and keep the law, but you need to stand fast in this liberty because 
we through the spirit and that's the capital s holy spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith not not by works amen hmm. all right uh brother cripps let me read verse five in the amplified it says um for we not relying on the law but through the strength and power of the holy spirit by faith are waiting confidently for the hope of righteousness that is the the power i mean the completion of our salvation wow so uh the amplified uh saying similar to what i just mentioned about uh, it, it it's true that if we don't have any part of salvation whatsoever if if indeed it is all the work of the holy spirit and i believe that it is uh, him opening our eyes and ears, uh, we, we come to him. Um, we, we come to him when we realize that we're a sinner and say, uh, you know, I, I realize that I'm in need of a savior. I realize that I, I'm a horrible person. I'm born into sin. Uh, that's our part. But uh, uh, all the rest of the work is done by the Holy Spirit. Um, again, you see these people trying. And if you're going back under the law, that's you trying. It, it, it's not only is it you not believing what Christ did is enough, it's then you going in your own power, uh, whatever it is, in works. Because you have to do works. Works is something you have to do. It, it is. You don't just wake up. If you're under works, if you're in Hebrew rooter, in, in other words, you have all these restrictions you have to follow. You have to follow them. And that's that that takes a lot out of you, I, I would assume. Because it, it, you're not in liberty then, you're under bondage, and, and being in bondage is, is hard work. Uh, that was, I love the way the Amplified put that. So it's saying that the, the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, and I agree with that, not relying on the law, but through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. Wow, that is, that is huge. Um, we, don't have to, we don't have to do it. The Holy Spirit does it through us. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we just... Um, my uh, soon-to-be father-in-law made a point, and I, I don't necessarily agree with it completely, but he was saying the people wait on God, because I made the point that we're, we're waiting on God. Um, and I don't think he uh, fully understood what I meant by that, uh, understood what I meant by that. But he said, well, now I hear what you're saying, but it doesn't mean just sitting in the corner with a blanket over your head and just saying, well, I'm, I'm waiting on God. He's right. That's not what it means. Um, waiting on God is a much more complicated process. But... I can't do anything in and of myself. I think the scripture makes that very clear, that it's all his work. It's his work, not our work. Okay, amen. Uh, yeah, there, uh, the word wait is in that verse. So I think uh, you're right applying it that way. Uh, obviously, uh, we are waiting for something. Not everything is done. Every, everything's accomplished for our salvation. But we're not completely saved in, in every sense. Uh, it, it says that uh, for the hope of righteousness by faith. Uh, well, um, there are people who would interpret this as, yeah. well, you've got your finger crossed hoping that you're ever going yes. to work out. But it's not that kind of a hope. It's really a, a confidence uh, in the promise, uh, promised um, uh, solution. Now, part of it's already done because um, the Bible says that we already are declared righteous. Uh, the Bible says we are already uh, justified. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Bible says we're already sanctified, which means we are already set apart and declared holy. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says we are already sitting in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. so, so these things, it's, it's already done and settled, but some things need to be done, uh, and that is, we need to uh, grow and mature to uh, whatever uh, heights we, we will during a lifetime. Uh, and we need to also get our um, eternal bodies that will no longer have a uh, sin nature. And therefore, we won't have uh, uh, that imperfection to deal with in the future. Mm -hmm. And so there are some things that still need to be done. And that's, that's the hope. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're waiting for. But uh, as far as salvation and righteousness and sanctification, all these things we have right now. Amen. All right. Um, any more before we go to verse six? No, that's good. All right. Let's, let me read verse six then in the KJV. It says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, 
but faith which worketh by love. Mm. This, this is what Paul does so well, going back over things, and and you know I'll continue to make this point as long as we're in the, the epistles, which will be for a little while longer. Uh, he he hits on the same point over and over and over again. Um, so in this one, in verse six, he's saying, "For in Jesus Christ, neither neither one makes any difference, but the difference is what faith does, and what faith does it, it it's it worketh by love." Um, I, I was talking to someone today about uh, being able to see love in a person. You, you should be able to see love. Love love is one of the most important things that's mentioned. I, and I believe Paul's the one that mentioned the greatest of these is love. Am I wrong? I think that's that's uh, uh, one of Paul's um, Paul's phrases. Uh, I think, uh, you know, charity, uh, charity is the greatest one. Um, and as a believer, uh, people should be able to see love in us. And when we have that faith and we have the Holy Spirit working in us, um, we should be expressing that fruit, that one of the most important fruits is love. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, uh, temperance, I believe. I hope I, uh, I got them all. Uh, but the greatest of these is love or, or, or charity. Um, so I think that's a good point there. So circumcision or answer, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one. Neither one of them. Uh, means anything, but what does mean something is uh, faith, which worketh by love. Beautiful. Mm, amen. And that's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is called the love chapter. That's where you'll find that, that faith, hope, and child, love, uh, but the greatest of these is love. All right, uh, Sister Renee. You guys, I, I know Crips will love this. I had that uh, Lord Shipper guy use this verse to try to prove uh, law keeping it because he called it faith which worketh by love that includes work um, wow so we really took this one up to still make it about what we're doing wow it just they find terms like this mm -hmm. and try to encompass all kinds of self-righteous works in it wow they just call it grace or call it faith but it's really faithfulness and obedience and you know and we all believe in that don't we sure. except we rely on the obedience of one. Jesus is obedience, not our own. Yes. It's not good enough. It's just not good enough. It'll never be good enough. And if it was, then I could boast. I'm saved because I was so obedient to my faith and working by love. Oh. You know what I mean, it, I could still boast. But I think what Paul's here saying, look, it's not, it doesn't matter whether you're physically circumcised or not. None of this stuff matters. But faith, which worketh by love and i think that is clearly us understanding god's love for us in christ so that we can work through the love of christ in us mm -hmm. and i do think it's a circle and that is god's plan for us i just don't like the these terms being twisted up to somehow condemn people again and look at themselves because that was his thing. Faith is worketh by love. Meanwhile, I was the most unloving person I ever spoke to publicly. Just the whole point was just to tear me to pieces and call me names. Yeah. So funny how they're always talking about loving and mm -hmm. they're the worst. Um, yeah, so. that they because they have a tell, Renee, not to interrupt you, but they have a tell. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see it. You can see it. Their mindset is, is set on works rather than love. They, yeah. they, th they think it's love, but... They're, they're not even able to take a step back and look at the words that are coming their, out of their mouth, which is clear that they don't love. Yeah. They think because they don't fornicate today or they didn't get drunk today. Now they're keeping the law, not realizing that the thoughts and intents of the heart also count. Yes. You know, the flesh. This is sinful flesh. That's why we need a new body. Mm -hmm. Flesh and blood can't inherit it. It is corrupted. Mm -hmm. So. It's crazy that people say that my pastor night was saying you guys know i'm a sinner like he's the holiest man i know didn't even kiss a woman until his wedding night i mean this man is so separated uh you know so he admits that he's still a sinner he's got pride he's got issues you know and so it's amazing to me when these people literally think they, they they'll look me in my face and say they don't sin actually that he had Lost his salvation once, but he got it. Got okay. it back. Well, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. So, uh, 
neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. So it doesn't matter about your flesh. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't, these religious works don't matter. It's faith, which worketh by love. It's God's love for us, which that dwells within us, that allows us uh, to manifest that into a productive, active faith. Praise God for that. Amen. Um, I guess uh, I would tell them that uh, if they think they lost their salvation and they got it back, they, they better understand that, uh, that there's a verse in Hebrews that says that's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you if you're thinking that that under your understanding is that you can lose your salvation, we well, you better realize then that means you can never get it back again. Yeah, that's what Messiah said to him. He said, but you've used that verse before about it's impossible to, so how did you lose it and get it back? It's just a lot, a lot of confusion and contradiction. Yeah. There's no sense in even debating it. Like they, like they can't hear you. If somebody thinks they, they stop spinning, they're, that's the end of the conversation. Renee, like, you, you, you hit on it. They can't, they literally cannot. Their eyes are not open. Their ears are not open. They literally cannot hear you. They can't. True. Well, Roman Catholicism is a perfect example of, of gaining and losing salvation over and over again. I call it the teeter totter. I'm saved. I'm lost. I'm saved. I'm lost. Saved. Lost. Wow. What uh, you, <laughs> then because what they do is they think that now, okay, they, if they die or right after they uh, have uh, take confess their sins and take communion, they better hope they die right then because as soon as they sin again, now they've lost and they're going to have to do penance, confession, penance, and get that Eucharist again to restore yeah. it. So it's a yep. constant teeter totter or yo yo or uh, plucking the what is it plucking the petals off. I I. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. When you take those rituals away from a Catholic, they really are in torment. Like it's really hard for a Catholic to get saved and just rest in what Christ did because they're so used to having these uh, cushions, these rituals that make them feel like they're in right standing with God all the time. If they go to mass every day or they do the rosary, they think they're okay. Now they did their Hail Marys. They did their Our Fathers. And it's very, very hard to get them to just rest in Christ. It's a really hard thing for them. It makes me real sad for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me read it in the, uh, in the Amplified, verse uh, 6. It says, um, For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but only faith activated and expressed and working through love. So, uh, you know, faith, and then uh, it says working through love. Um, I'm not really sure I understand what that means, but only faith and act activated and expressed and working through love. Anybody want to uh, tell me about, about that one? Let me see. Let me see how it reads it in the KJV. It says, Nor so, but faith worketh which worketh by love. I, I don't know if I got any uh, thing from you on that, that I, I'm not sure what that, how to take that. Um, I, I can take a stab at, I think that the, uh, he's, the Amplified is saying uh, what Paul, what Paul said in the King James uh, makes the point that availeth nothing. Then he's, then he says neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. And the Amplified is trying to explain the same thing. Basically, the beginning of the Amplified is almost word for word the same. And then they say, but only faith activated and expressed and working through through love. So uh, Amplified is, is just making the point that the faith is activated uh, through the Holy Spirit based, based on the context of what's been said before. That's how the faith gets activated is through the Holy Spirit. And the way it's expressed is working through love. That's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure how to take it, but I will say this. Uh, my faith was activated by love. Uh, I know that because I, when I re recall my time of salvation, I, I, not everybody can say they know when they got saved. I don't, I'm not going to tell you the day or the hour, but I can remember very clearly the, 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 the moment, whatever that was. It was in a December of 1986 uh, some one evening, 
as I'm reading the, the, through the Bible and, and reading the Gospel of John, and it, it, I came to the realization how much Jesus loved me. Uh, you know, he, he loved me so much that he was willing to actually die for me. And there, Jesus said, there's no greater love than being able to offer your, your life to die for a friend. So he, get, he offered, showed me the greatest love, and it, it, it affected me in a way where I, I couldn't help but love him back. And so it was this love of God and my response to love him back that, that um, um, was the activating factor of my, my faith. And um, I, I, didn't, I didn't come to uh, Jesus for salvation to be saved from hell. I really wasn't even thinking of that. It's not that I didn't have any uh, consciousness or belief that there's, uh, there's a hell. It's just that it was the furthest thing from my mind was that it was it was entirely based on this great love that God has for me, and then I loved Him back and wanted won this relationship with Him and believed. Uh, so I don't know um, I don't know if that is uh, relevant to, to the state on this verse, but I don't know how else to think of the verse. Well, the point you're making, I'm glad that you made that made that point because even when I, as, as a believer, when when someone has witnessed to me. They always ask the question, do you know you're going to heaven? I was like, well, yeah, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what Christ did. Um, and and the, the the contrast to that is true, too. It says, oh, are, are, do you know you're not going to hell? I mean, hell's, a, don't get me wrong, hell's a horrible place. Lake of Fire is even worse. I, I don't want to go to either of them. Uh, but I'm not motivated by that. I never have been. Fortunately, uh, I, I grew up in a, in a Christian family, and they weren't, they not that they didn't believe that hell existed, but they weren't uh, fire and brimstone. Fortunately, that's, that's all I'm saying. And when we moved to the South, there was a lot of that around the fire and brimstone thing. And I'm just glad I wasn't, I, I didn't come to a saving faith based on my fear of hell is my point. Uh, neither was it motivation necessarily uh, by heaven either. Heaven's great. I, it's going to be beyond anything I could ever ask or think. But what's more motivating, as Brother Luke just pointed out, and I completely agree, and that's wonderful that you, uh, and, and I'm not surprised that you understand that, but it's more understanding what he did for us. The, the, the absolute grace and glory of God sending his son into the world to save us wretched sinners. We, we don't deserve it, and that's what grace is. Grace isn't something we deserve. We definitely don't deserve it, but yet he gives it anyway. That should be enough to bring someone to saving faith. And then it's not based on you're not living for heaven. You're not living to avoid hell. You're living for Christ who died for you and, and rose again to save you, not just to, to put you in a particular place, but to reconcile you to him, to have a relationship with him. That To me, that's what it's about. And apparently that's what it is about to you, uh, Brother Luke, as well. Um, the focus should be on the relationship with him because of what he did for you, because he loved you so much and not necessarily the destination, but there's a lot of focus on that. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll go to the next verse. Uh, in the KJV, verse seven says, uh, ye did run well, who did who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Sister Renee? Yeah, um, he brings them back, telling them, look, you, you guys started on the right foundation. When I left you, you were clear. You received the spirit by faith in what Christ did. It was as if Jesus was crucified among you. You guys knew what the gospel was. I leave. Somebody comes in, bewitches you, and now you go back to, first of all, as Gentiles, you were never under the law, but you get tricked into thinking somehow you've got to become a Jew to be a Christian, uh, and, and that's all messed up. And so you did run well. When, when I left you, you were doing well. Uh, and that says, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? When people talk about obeying the gospel, they try to put works into that. <laughs> obeying the gospel is to remain in the truth of what Christ has done for us. The, the works. That's what obeying the gospel it means, to believe the truth of what Christ has done. That's what obey the truth means. It means to adhere to the truth of what got you saved. Staying 
in what Jesus did. So what he's asking them is, you did run well, you were doing good. Who did hinder you? So somebody came and hindered you, it prevented your growth. Hindering is to prevent growth or to keep from moving. And so he's asking them, who did this to you guys? Who hindered you that you would leave the truth of Christ and what he's done for you uh, and, and get mixed up into this kind of stuff? So I think this is like a rhetorical question. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Well, the question was asked earlier, too, who hath bewitched you? And we went into detail about to answer that question. But uh, Sister Renee, did I hear your dog uh, shout out an amen? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. Tell your dog amen back. I've been trying to keep him calm, man, but he's just squeaking and tearing up stuff in the background and barking. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> That's all right. I'm all in favor of a shouting out amen. Anybody feel like feel the spirit uh, urging them to, to jump and shout, do it. I like to do that myself. I, I do it a lot of times when the camera's off. And you'd be surprised what I'm doing here. Yeah, I do too. I'll do the amen. <laughs> and put my hands up. All right. Brother Cripps, let me read that uh, verse uh, uh, seven in the. Uh, is that verse seven? Yeah, verse yeah. 7 in the uh, Amplified says, uh, you were running uh, the race well. Who has interfered and prevented you from obeying the truth? Yeah, R Renee did a good job of explaining that. But I think it's interesting the Amplified used that term, the race, because uh, there's uh, Paul used that. And this is another, uh, uh, not this verse necessarily, but uh, the, the verse about, you know, continue the race. And um, uh, they throw in there that, that that's the race that Paul talks about that we have to persevere to the end. They, they, they make it something completely different. But uh, to me, it, uh, what Paul is uh, referencing is that what Renee said, that you, you started out on the right foundation. I, I agree with that. I think that's accurate. They started on the right foundation, but then they've gone off the track. I mean, it, it, if we're calling it a race and the race is you're staying on the track that, that, uh, the track of truth, the track of grace, the track of uh, of faith. And if you're going back into the law, you're off the track then. I mean, you could use a, a hundred different analogies. Another one would be, you know, you're in the battlefield uh, of, of faith. You're, 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 in, you're in the battle. You're fighting the battle. And then you've gone off the field into something else. They have gone off track. They absolutely have. Um, so uh, Paul's saying you started out your your race you started out well I, I i'm melding the two so the amplified calls it a race paul doesn't call it that but uh they i i agree with with uh them determining that, that that's what paul's referring to uh otherwise he wouldn't have said it i mean there's other verse where he, he uh, uh, likens it to the olympic uh games that were popular at the time uh, you know, except we're not going for a corruptible crown. We're not going for uh, laurels and stuff put on our head that uh, decay. Uh, the reward we get, our uh, the, the crown of life, we, we get a chance uh, indeed to live forever with the one that saved us. And no one can take that away from us, uh, one, the, that, that gift that God gives us. Uh, so that's all I have to say. So he, he, they started out well. Uh, and I think we know the answer to the question. I, I agree it's rhetorical because uh, Paul's making it clear who it is. They all know who it is. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Because they're not obeying the truth right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, people will uh, try to take this verse and um, use it to support their works uh, heresy. Uh, but... Uh, this verse and other places when Paul talks about, uh, you know, racing, um, it's really uh, uh, the, the, your uh, ministry, your, your, your walk uh, or race as a Christian uh, to, because uh, you're going to be going to that Bema seat and, and your works will be judged. Uh, it'll either be wood, stay in Hubble or gold, silver, precious gems. And that's what's at risk here. But you don't even get to race and compete for these things unless you are designated as a runner. Uh, so in order to be put on that track and enter the race, 
you have to be a believer. When you're a believer, now the race begins. I've often said that um, once you believe, now you've punched in. Your time clock's punched in. You're you're uh, you're uh, you're on the time clock, and now you're gonna you're on the payroll. Uh, and so, uh, people who want to teach that um, uh, there is no uh, reward system. Uh, I've heard someone say that Jesus is the reward, and that's I'm sorry to say that's horribly wrong. It's clearly taught by Jesus that he says, don't build up your treasures on earth where moths and rust can destroy it, but build up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. And Paul tells us to, to get busy working to earn these crowns and these uh, rewards, and it's going to be judged at the beam of the seat. So Paul and Jesus really are urging us on to uh, get to busy working for treasures and rewards, um, and but you can't earn any of them. I mean, let, look at uh, some of the people in the world who have been oh, great. They've been great human beings as far as, uh, you know, uh, the philanthropy, charity, uh, uh, kindness. But if they if they never got born again and became a child of God, uh, that that really gains them nothing except worldly treasures, accolades and recognition by the world. But uh, in order for it to count for God, you have to become a child of God first. When you're a child of God through faith in Christ, then you're put on the racetrack. And now you can start. I remember Bible Jim, he used to think of it as a competition. I even just used the word competition. I don't think we're competing with each other for rewards. But in a race, normally you, you think of it as I'm competing with the others. Uh, but uh, everybody in the race is winning as long as you're, you're, uh, you're uh, running. You're, the running means you're, you're working again. Uh, if anybody thinks that we're not in all favor, we're all gung-ho about works, we are. But that's not how we get eternal life. Eternal life comes as a gift from Jesus because we trust him for it. And the, the rewards and all that is, is earned. So there is a merit system for, for Christians. We, we are going to be rewarded by personal merit, by what we do uh, to serve Christ. All right. Uh, all right. Any more from either of you before we... Go to the next verse. Yeah, just real quick. I like what you said there. Uh, we're not against works. We're, I mean, <laughs> I, you explained it. I, I can't add anything to, to, to that the way you explained it. I would just say just because we believe in grace doesn't mean we're saying uh, don't work at all. We're not saying put a blanket over your head, like like I, I, I said, and sit in your living room and do nothing. No, we're not saying that. We're saying that that's not what saves you. What Christ did on the cross saves you. He saved you. Nothing we do saves us. It's filthy righteousness rags. <laughs> Amen. You know, Paul, uh, he, he cautioned people uh, a couple of times about not boasting, but that's about boasting uh, that you deserve salvation. Um, but he did say, I, excuse me, but I'm going to have to boast a little bit because you're not recognizing me as an apostle and you're not recognizing all I've been through for this cause. And he went through a laundry list of things that he's suffered and endured for the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will say on my behalf that uh, I, I'm working all the time for, for in my ministry and I'm getting quite worn out from it at times. There are times where I'm just feel like I'm just exhausted from it. And, um, uh, you, you see it a little bit, you know, three nights a week on these programs, uh, what we're, we, we do, but um, and every one of us is doing much more in terms of uh, trying to, to serve the Lord and the church, the congregation behind the scenes that nobody knows about. And it can be exhausting. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are busy working, but it's, uh, it's, I'm not doing it because, I mean, I'm happy that if, if, if I end up getting some rewards, I'm certainly going to be happy about it. Sure. It's not my motivation, though. It's not why I'm doing it. It's just for the glory of God. I just love the Lord, and I love the saints, and I want to serve uh, however I can. All right. All right, let's go to KJV, what, verse 8 now, right? Yeah. Eight. Um, uh, okay. Whose turn is it this time? Uh, I think it's mine. Okay. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. 
Uh, yeah, so I think he's talking about the the persuasion of going back under the law and whatnot. I, I, I think that's what he's referring to, since that's what the context is, the whole thing. Um, so he's saying, okay, if the, the person that called us is the Holy Spirit of Christ, I mean, that that's who called us. So Paul's saying that this persuasion, this going back under the law, this going back under bondage, doesn't come from him. Um, it, it comes from someone else. So if it doesn't come from him, who does it come from? Uh, it comes from uh, Satan. I mean, ultimately, that's what it comes from. It comes from other people. They're the, they're the workers of iniquity, but it, it, it comes ultimately from the evil one. Okay, amen. Sister Renee? Yeah, this verse is overlooked a lot. I, I did a video on it a few months ago. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. So this persuasion, if you want to say this persuasion of people or this, this legalistic persuasion upon God's people doesn't come from God. So it's not God sending these people to you, like Jason said. Now, if it's not God, who is it? It's the enemy. It comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is a liar. He doesn't want you. If he can't take your salvation, he wants to take your victory. And uh, somebody in the chat was mentioning, you know, Satan will use scripture to condemn him and show him how he fails. But one thing he'll never do is tell you the blood of Christ cleanses you from all unrighteousness. You are in right standing with God because of what Christ has done for you. You can rest in Jesus. He'll never do that. But he will always preach the law. Because we fail. We fail it. It condemns us. It's the ministry of condemnation. It's the ministry of death. So this persuasion, whether you say it's the, the people, this persuasion of people, or this persuasion, this, this uh, trying to persuade you to go in the direction of legalism, is not of him which calleth you, who calleth you. The Lord does. So they're not of God. And Jason was very clear on who the persuasion is from. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, let me read verse 8 in the Amplified. It says, This deceptive persuasion is not from him who called you to freedom in Christ. So it's, yeah, it's deceptive persuasion. And it's talking about earlier, uh, uh, let me see, what was it, the phrase used before? Uh, about let me see. There wasn't there a question about who? Let me see. Yeah, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? So this question, who did? I, I'm going to make take a moment because I'm always have to assume that there are some people who didn't see some of the earlier talks on Galatians. But all throughout the book of Galatians, we've been making the point that uh, uh, this uh, this is referring to the false teachers who were accusing Paul of being a false teacher and a false apostle. Uh, they're called uh, the Judaizers. They're called uh, men from Judea. They're referred to as certain men from James. Um, they are teaching that um, fa faith in, in Jesus as the promised savior is not enough, that, that you've got to also keep following Judaism and if you're not a Jew, you need to convert and become a Jew. So it's Judaism plus Jesus. This is what they're teaching, and that's who they are. And it's, it's an ongoing problem for Paul. Uh, he's not only talks about here in Galatians, but his other writings. And uh, he, these are the false teachers. And I believe that perhaps Paul had a bad back or, 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 or bad eyes. But I, th I think there's a very good chance that uh, when it says that he had a thorn in his flesh, if you read that context of everything leading up to that, uh, I think that we could easily conclude that the thorn in the flesh was kind of a, a modern uh, way of expressing it is, boy, these, these guys are really a pain in the ass. They're, they're following me into all my churches and trying to ruin all my churches. And, and by uh, spoiling the gospel with another gospel. So uh, that's what the thorn in the flesh is. The people who are constantly working to, to, to ruin Paul's ministry. 
Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with you. And I, I heard another sermon today where a guy was saying it was some kind of uh, physical thing. And I agree with you, as you've said before and, and just repeated, I think it was these uh, Judaizers <laughs> who were constantly messing up his, his churches that he uh, uh, set up for God. He laid the ground groundwork and they come in and trying to tear tear the the uh, all the work that he did down. I mean, the Holy Spirit did the work, but you get what I mean. He he physically started these churches and he had to keep coming back. I mean, that that's what all these epistles are about. It's him trying to get these people back on track because they've gotten off track. Yeah, it's uh, I think it's important to realize that each one of Paul's letters are letters to believers. And that's that's something that cannot be ignored. Uh, he's writing to believers, and he's writing to them as follow up. He, you know, he he's a he's a, an evangelist and a church planter. He did not really serve as a pastor, uh, as a rule. I mean, he would stay, I imagine, some places for a little while, but he'd move on and try to get a new church started, a missionary, and and then. Uh, but he wanted to stay in touch and, and do follow-up um, and make sure that the church is doing well and he'd get reports back and then he'd have to write letters. And that's what this is all about, right? He's corresponding with the churches he started and trying to help them to, uh, you know, be faithful to the, the gospel and to and to uh, mature and be productive uh, witnesses for Jesus. Mm. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to the KJV uh, verse, uh, oh, Sister, whose turn is it first this time? A right. little a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I already talked about that, so I'll skip it myself. But uh, Sister Renee, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Yeah, uh, like what you were saying earlier, a little bit of uh, poison kills. So just like this, a little bit of false teaching destroys the gospel. A tiny bit of works added to the gospel makes Christ of no effect to you. So if you start allowing these errors in, it destroys the entire foundation. The foundation must be Christ finished work alone. That's the foundation. It's always Jesus. So a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. You, you cannot allow an error into the foundation of the church. Amen. Deadly. Okay, let me read that in the, uh, I don't think I'll be much different in the, <laughs> can't imagine changing a whole lot in the Amplified. Verse 9 in the Amplified says, uh, a little leaven, that is a slight inclination to error or a few false teachers, leavens the whole batch, that is, it perverts the concept of faith and misleads the church. Well, they did do a good job, didn't they, Chris? Yeah, they sure did. Um, yeah, you went into it already. Uh, I, I went into it a little bit using the different terminology of uh, 99% uh, good, good, clean water, no poison, 1% poison. It, it's still poison. Um, put leaven in a bread and you're trying to make unleavened bread and it, it's going to ruin it. Uh, it's going to ruin the whole lump. It's not going to ruin part of it. It's going to ruin all of it. Um, that's why it's so insidious. I mean, that's the word for it. Uh, false teachers, uh, false doctrines. They're insidious, and we're not to take them lightly. Absolutely not. Um, and and there are people that have ministries that all they do is they go and try to point out people that that have um, uh, have false doctrines and things like that. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, even lordship people do that with us about grace. So uh, it's important to determine what the leaven is. It certainly is important. Um, but in this case, I think we know what the leaven is. It's going back in, under the law and uh, bondage uh, based on what Paul's opinion is and based on the context of these scriptures that we're reading. Yeah, in this case, and I would say that generally that's the leaven. Uh, matter of fact, I think uh, even uh, Jesus or uh, interprets at one point. Uh, so at some point, there's an actual interpretation of what the leaven is, and it's it's called false doctrine. Yeah, I think another point it might even say that the the leaven is the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. I believe, if I'm correct, but uh, uh, in this case, and I'd say that uh, with them at that time, and 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 all through history and today, the leaven has primarily been uh, adding works 
to the, the, the gospel. But I would say it's important to understand that um, this idea of the, the cross plus nothing, that means anything, anything you are adding as a requirement then is leaven and, and, it, and it runs the whole thing. Um, whether you're imposing some kind of a, a work system like water baptism or confessing of your sins or, or changing a life or repentance, or whether it's even uh, requiring that they people understand other other theological things in the Bible that are not related to the cross, that are not uh, part of the uh, the gospel and salvation. If we say you, you've got to understand and believe all these tenets, like we have a lot of things where we say these are non-essentials, and we say you don't have to agree with that. If we if we say that you have to agree with one of these things that we label as a non-essential, then we're adding it to the cross and saying, no, the cross is not enough. You've got to also agree with us on eschatology or whatever. Uh, so uh, there are so many things that could be used uh, 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 a, a person's life, judging you know how um, well you think a person has, uh, their life has changed uh, uh, as, as evidence. Well, there wasn't any real conversion there because there's no evidence in a changed life then you've added to the cross it's the cross plus nothing or uh or it's not the gospel okay um let me see we got uh, verse 10 in the kjv says i have confidence in you through the lord that ye will be none otherwise minded but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment Whosoever he be. Wow. Whose turn is it? Cripps? Is it your turn? Uh yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. Um have confidence in you through the Lord that you may be none otherwise minded. Yeah, so don't uh confidence of the Lord, don't don't be of another mind. Don't be otherwise minded uh, aside from what they've already been taught, what Paul has already taught them, what the Holy Spirit is already trying to work on their life. But he that troubleth you, okay, so that's the uh, that's the people that are coming and trying to put them back under bondage. Uh, you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. So whoever's bringing the false, uh, the false doctrine, regardless of what area it comes from, what type of leaven it is, um, uh, you you end up bearing the the, the that judgment. Uh, so he's he's trying to trying to say don't uh, have conf. Oh, so he's saying he has confidence in you. So he has confidence in them through the Lord. Um, you know, we talked about last week. He says, "I stand in doubt of you." Yeah, that may be true. Uh, uh, Paul may have had doubts about them, but in this verse, he's saying that he has confidence. And where does the confidence come from? It comes through the Lord, uh, that you will be none otherwise minded. So um, not stay in the in this uh, bondage under the law. That's, that's the whole point of what he's writing the letter about in the first place is to get them back on track. So this is good. This is, there's, this is uh, hopefully Paul's coming, you know, he's pointed out to him what, uh, where they're wrong. And uh, I don't know for sure because I haven't read ahead, but this may be where he starts building them up again. Uh, this is this is definitely a pattern that he does. Mm, very good point. Thank you. All right, Sister Renee. Yeah, I, I need to scroll down a little bit so I can see it better. Yeah, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be not otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you prepares judgment whoever he be. So after dealing with this, uh, he realizes they were on the right foundation. They got pitched for whatever reason. These legalists came in and tricked them into thinking uh, now they got to be justified for something they're doing. But he's brought them back to obeying the truth, explaining to them how, you know, to cast out the bottom and the son to stand in the liberty. So now that he's dealt with this, He's telling the church, I have confidence in you. Now, we've dealt with this, that you're not going to fall for this again. Like, uh, he spent so much time explaining to them how not only is it wrong, but it's going to destroy your walk. It's going to keep you from being able to save souls. You're off the right foundation. And Christ himself is going to be of no effect. Like, it's, it's just completely destroying this church. 
And so he says he has confidence uh, in them through the Lord. Uh, that there'll be none otherwise minded, meaning that they're not going to believe these legalists again. And the ones that came in and convinced them of this and scared them. How many people have we seen troubled because they were resting in Christ? They believed the good news. They got joy. And then some clever lordship teacher told him, if you don't do this, you weren't really saved. If you don't have this evidence, you're not really saved or their twist of verse. And they literally trouble them. They steal their joy and their peace. And instead of resting in Christ, now they're looking back at themselves and they're all troubled and confused. So whoever troubled this church and confused them and messed up uh, the foundation that they have, he's going to bear the judgment. As a matter of fact, the verse that comes to mind is him who destroys God's temple, he will destroy now, a lot of people use that verse. They see if you drink and you do this and uh, God's going to destroy you for destroying his temple. It's not even talking about people abusing their physical body. It's talking about destroying what a man of God has built up in another person. It's about destroying the faith that's built on the right foundation. And another comes along and destroys that temple. That's what he's talking about. Read that verse again. I, I'll pull it up here in a second when it says, uh, and him who destroys God's temple, he will destroy. It is not talking about people abusing their physical body through drugs or alcohol. It's talking about another man, a false prophet coming along and destroying the temple of God with false teaching. I'm going to, I'm going to pull that up. Hmm, okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified, and then uh, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view contrary to mine on the matter. But the one who is disturbing you, whoever he is, will have to bear the penalty. Uh, I think... Uh, what I'd like to focus on is this uh, point Paul's making. He says, whosoever he be. Uh, Paul said at the beginning that uh, it didn't matter if we or an angel were to tell you a different gospel. It, it's cursed. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's an angel or any person. If he or any of his co-workers or any else, any other apostle, anybody tells him contrary, then it's it's a false gospel and a curse. So I think this whosoever he be, I mean, it's not a question to me, like whosoever he be, like we don't know who these people are. They know who they are. They're the the uh, men from uh, Judea, uh, the, the, the Judaizers. They very well know who they are. And so whosoever he be is not a question of, well, we don't know who they are. It's, it's, it should be understood, I think, as it doesn't matter whoever they are, whosoever they are. It doesn't matter how big they are and important you may think they are uh, if they're teaching a false gospel. Right. Agreed. And, uh, yeah. So uh, I think that it's time now for us to, that should be the last verse, I think. But Renee, you had a verse you wanted to mention. Yeah. I do. I, I think um, I did a video last year on this, I think, maybe, uh, where it talks about, you know, a lot of people use this to try to uh, say uh, that God's talking. And he could be, you know, if you're a drink, if you do drugs and you drink or he's going to destroy you because you're hurting your own body. But that's not what the verse is saying. But they'll use this verse. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. But look at the context. What does he say? According to the grace of God, which is given me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So it's about building upon the temple of God. That is a believer, right? For other foundation can no man lay that is laid which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, 
gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he's built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Know ye not that you're the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you if any man defile the temple of God. So the whole context here is how we build into believers. Once they're saved, that's why he says, if one of you is spiritual, build the other up. It's about building in them doctrine and God's word. Be careful how you build thereupon. So I think the thing is, if you defile God's temple, if you tear down that believer, if you start stripping him instead of edifying him, God will defile you, will, will destroy you. Mm. I, I really think that's what this is talking about. Based on the context of the surrounding scripture, mm -hmm. well, when yeah. he talks about drinking and fornicating and everything else, when he's talking about building upon the temple itself, right? Well, um, I know that there's a, a lot of us who are looking forward to a new temple being built as part of eschatology, a, a, a third temple, and uh, but I believe, um, in, in, in the time of Jesus's life and ministry. That the real temple was Christ Himself. He yeah. said, "Tear down this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again." Yeah, that was the true temple, mm -hmm. and I believe that the temple today and since Pentecost has been the church, all believers. We are the temple of God. Yeah, uh, and so I, that's why I'm not looking forward to, as most of you do, that there's going to be another temple built. I, I'm skeptical of that. And yeah. It may be the case, but I, I believe that the new temple is already us, and we're the one that's going to be destroyed. The church will be destroyed through the uh, the last days. Amen. Um, it could uh, be both. It's one of those things that could be a, a double prophecy for sure, but I agree completely with you that uh, during the uh, tribulation time, they're going to in some way uh, uh, insert uh, something in us. It could be the mark. I don't know. I mean, it's a topic for another discussion, but... Um, somehow defile the temple, which is the us. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Try to, at least. I just watched uh, two videos today. I, I think they're both about 30 minutes, and it went through uh, uh, all of the book of Revelation. I, I've listened to it. Uh, you know, so many people teach through the book of Revelation and I got so many different perspectives on it, but it was one of the best uh, I've seen. And I saved them, so I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, if anybody's interested, I'll, I'll forward them uh, to you. But uh, it was really, really good. And, and I, I'd like to get everybody's, uh, if you're interested, uh, I'll send it to you and get your feedback, see if you, you're impressed as I am on it. Sure. Um, all right, let's um, let's give our uh, summary remarks here, uh, brother Ben. You've uh, you've been quiet all night, but I'm assuming you've been paying attention. What's your feedback for us? Well, you guys did awesome, of course. Um, a couple of things, so I, I wanted to share. Um, again, I, I meant to meant to mention this before, but now I think I'll bring it full circle. I probably won't mention it again unless someone asks. But this, I think, this was a really awesome uh, discovery for me. Um, and that is, I mentioned before, I, I was troubled by the word anathema in the Bible, exactly what it meant, because there's all kinds of different opinions. And so uh, I tra traced the etymology of that word and looked at that word in the Old Testament. And it, it, in the Old Testament, it's referred to as kerem or kerem. And one of the first episodes you see in the Bible where, where kerem or karem is used is the episode of Achan, where uh, they Joshua is leading the army of Israel into the promised land. And, and God says the the goods of this particular land um you're not it, it's anathema in other words it, it's uh it's it excluded you don't you know mark and avoid it it's not it's not uh it's off limits essentially yet and so Achan uh saw this babylonian shiny armor and the word that the bible uses to say that when he took that is that he saw it he coveted it and took it so just like even in, in the garden uh where uh the the law the the law which is the picture of the uh, tree of good and evil um, made made them weak that you know eating from the tree of law uh, made them weak it just like this armor that Achan took I believe is a picture of uh, essentially the law uh, where 
you know, the law wants you, makes you want to festoon yourself with the trappings of the law so you stand out among your peers so you're all shiny and looking good. Um, and so, uh, and what happened when he took that, took the uh, armor is that, and again, this is exact parallel to Galatians. I, it's like, I felt like God was leading me to this because there's so many parallels. Is that uh, a, uh, God said, okay, someone took this armor, that the, uh, the anathema, uh, and they've troubled the camp. That was the word that God used. They troubled the camp. Well, we just we just read the word that how, how these men troubled these Galatians. Um, and again, a little law or a little false doctrine, which which always get your focus back on yourself or question yourself, and it makes you weak. Uh, and that's exactly what happened with, with uh, the the that this episode when Achan took the uh, armor is that they became weak. The, the Israel started losing in battle, and God said, "If you don't take care of this problem." Uh, I'm not going to be with you anymore. And that's exactly what is what happened with Galatians is that it's not like they lost their salvation, but what happened is the spirit, eventually they quenched the spirit because they're trying to follow the law. They were running well. You think of running as kind of like, you, you know, soaring in the spirit almost. Um, you're not focused on yourself. You're just focused on your freedom with, in Christ. Uh, but someone will cut in on you and try to say, oh, no, no, examine yourself. Make sure, you know, I, I, are you keeping the law? Uh, any quality about yourself. Um, and again, the law is a form of godliness, but denying its power, which is the Holy Spirit. Um, and again, when as soon as uh, Israel dealt with that problem with Achan, um, God was came right back with them again, and they they started conquering again. Um, and again, when Paul said, uh, you know, anathema, it means something that's set aside. It was interesting that Paul kind of added that as an inclusio. He said, well. I do not, even though they want you to set aside the grace of God, I do not set aside the grace of God or exclude the grace of God. Um, I thought that was so cool. And uh, you guys definitely covered on that, but I just wanted to kind of put an Old Testament spin on it. All right. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, brother Cripps, give us uh, give us your uh, summary remarks, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was excited at the beginning about it uh, being a fresh chapter. I was not disappointed, and uh, uh, Paul really came through. So, uh, Brother Luke can be happy. I don't have anything negative or disagree with uh, with Paul in any way, at least for tonight. So, <laughs> uh, it was great. It was. Uh, I thought everyone made excellent points. Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm glad that uh, we we're able to to get through uh, several chapters and. Uh, uh, happy as usual to be here again. I continue to learn uh, more and more as we uh, study together, and I, I, I consider it a real gift from God to to be a part of these broadcasts. And I'll uh, say that I'm looking forward to next week, and uh, say good night to everyone in the chat. I hope every everyone uh, is doing well out there too. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's very nice. I mean, you're going to have a lot when you meet Paul. You're you got a lot of explaining to do, Lucy. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have some questions for him, too. <laughs> All right, Sister Renee. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ben was talking about troubling. There's also the story of the angel who troubled the waters. And the person that got in right after the angel stirred the waters up, they'd be healed. Remember? The man yeah. was in there for a long time. Yeah. So troubling can also mean to stir up. And it's, it seemed like that's what these people did. They came in and stirred up trouble troubled everything, stirred it up into chaos, and took them off the solid foundation of Christ. Um, and sadly, even saved people, I, I find they get a deal of God, and they go right back to that religious thinking and say, okay, I might be saved, but now uh, God deals with me on my performance. That he's dealing with me, his love for me, and my prayers being answered are based on my performance now. And so we still have that religious thinking instead of resting in Christ. Now, I, I believe we all believe in living obedient, godly lives. Like none of us have ever said anything other than that. But it's just it, it should be effortless. And it's more about love for people than it is these legalistic rules. And the religious mindset will never be able to hear it. Uh, and uh, it's so unfortunate that it, it, you know but what i do see is that the devil must really hate the power of resting in god's grace 
because every church Paul planted, he immediately came up and put false prophets there to come up behind him and undo his work. I mean, that is what the devil did with Paul constantly. It was never, people weren't coming in and saying, hey, uh, go send more. No, that wasn't what was messing the churches up. It was legalism that came in and destroyed the churches. Religious people. That's what it was. Every time there was a problem, it was people trying to tell them they had to be justified by the law. Every epistle addresses this thorn in Paul's flesh, this constant undoing of what he set up. So I wish more people could see it really is, you know, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. So I loved this chapter and that's interesting, Ben. I uh, I was doing a lot of Old Testament shadow videos. I'd like to get back to those uh, and start reading the Old Testament again. Um, but tomorrow night, I plan on having Thursday's throwdown uh, with Lisa. Uh, about heaven. I'm just not sure yet, but that is the game plan. Uh, I haven't heard back from her, but if she does it, it will be about that. It'll be tomorrow at 9 p.m. So it was good to see you guys tonight. Okay. Thank you, sister. Um, all right. Well, I enjoyed this very much. Uh, I uh, to, Today, I, I don't know if you're interested, but Today is August 26th. It's my wife's birthday. Uh, she's 69, and uh, uh, but she looks 20 years younger. She's still very beautiful. And uh, uh, but it's also our anniversary. Uh, 41 years. Oh, happy anniversary! Happy birthday! Of course, of course, we're interested. I married her on her birthday. I figured I wanted to give her the best birthday present ever, so I gave her me. <laughs> and you'll never forget it. Uh, that was smart, yeah. Luke. So uh, I'm going to try to make it nine more years so we can make it to 50. Uh, and uh, so we had a, a great time today celebrating her birthday and her anniversary. Um, but uh, in spite of that, I still didn't want to miss tonight and to, to be with everybody here. And I enjoyed this time with everybody very much as usual. Um so don't forget to join Sister Renee uh, tomorrow, but join us also on this channel, uh, CES, for the Friday night program, Fun Fellowship Friday, 9.30 Eastern Time. And I want to uh, thank again uh, Sister Heather for uh, volunteering to help us out as a moderator again. So Hendricks, you're, you're not alone there. You've got help with Sister Heather. Appreciate you both very much. Your moderators are really in this church you're, you're the deacons of our church and it's a great responsibility and uh and what you do is greatly appreciated by us so thank you so much for that and um uh, that's it for now uh thank you for being with us everybody tonight look forward to next time bless you all in the name of our great savior god jesus